to have access to it, whether it's leased or owning it, simply so there aren't chemicals being sprayed across the street. Um, we are at risk of spray damage. Um, but I think I think for us, it's it's really focusing on how do we how do we start that perennial dream? Um, the annuals have been so labor intensive, and I, I think we found, especially this year, that we don't have as much time as we'd like to work on installing the fruit and nut plantings, um, outlining and, and defining what those education events would be. So, so how do we tackle the parking lot? How do we define, you know, what types of events we're going to host? Mm -hmm. um, we do that in the off season, um, but the off season is also times when you're doing crop plans, you're closing the books. Um, and, you know, so it's like, yes, I would like more acreage, mostly because I would like less acreage to be used conventionally today, right? <laughs> it's not really that we want more acreage. We just want less acreage allotted to uh, monocrop, yeah. uh, chemically infused corn and soy. <laughs> build the wall. So <laughs> build the wall. There you go. Uh, the wind damage. Yeah. It, it, it is. Yeah. I, I think I've also been surprised with regard to the acreage question about how much food you can really grow in a small amount of space. And you've probably seen this with your own garden is like, there comes a time when even if you've only grown a couple zucchini plants, for example, you are swimming in zucchini. You have, you're leaving it in your neighbor's cars if they leave their, you know, doors unlocked or whatever, or cucumbers too is another one where it's like, all of a sudden you have way too many cucumbers. Right. I remember I was uh, maybe 12 or 13 visiting my cousin's farm, uh, Southern Turkey. And they were doing, I mean, everybody, almost everybody is uh, financially uh, forced to do more of conventional farming. Uh, it's not like back in the day when my dad was a, a young kid. But I remember um, everybody was having a good time. All of a sudden, uh, my cousin back then, he was maybe like 30 years old or so. Uh, he came in crying and he grabbed the shotgun. And everybody was like, what happened? Um, his favorite hunting dog ate a dead animal. The dead animal uh, ate yeah. something poisonous. Yeah. And the animal was suffering, so he had to end the misery. But as an you know, 11, 12 year old kid, I still uh, remember that. Forget about just uh, slowly damaging our own DNA, our own health, our children, you know, the, the quicker, more imminent dangers of using all the pesticides and whatnot. And, like you're driving down the highway and the windows down, you have no idea. The guy was just uh, spraying an hour ago, and then, oh, nice farm air. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other part of that too is that all this corn and soy that you see growing and being sprayed by chemicals is not even for human consumption. You know, so we a lot a lot of land here in the United States to crops that are not even feeding America. Yeah, go for it. I know you got your I'm a big stat. stats yeah. guy. I like having data. Um, so you'll often see um, politicians, uh, lobby organizations touting Illinois' prowess in growing corn and soy and pumpkins um, and, and being, you know, global leaders um, in those crops. 95% of the food we eat in Illinois is grown outside of Illinois. That means only 5%, only 5% only of the more than $40 billion Illinois food industry takes place in Illinois. Um, only 5%. Yeah, right? And that's crazy. So those are the things we're trying to work to overcome is... Mm -hmm. 
we, we were at least one point in time, Illinois was known for having the, you know, some of the best soil in the world and, and maybe we still do. Um, I imagine most of it has been harmed with chemicals mm -hmm. and at the expense of even being able to grow food, right? We're sending it to make biofuels or animal feed. We've separated the animals from the land and I could go down the rabbit hole on this one, um, but I'll pause there and see <laughs> if that's really the direction we should go. <laughs> uh, do you have, like, can you name one country that would be a great example for United States to follow if, <clears throat> if, um, say, the Green Party USA takes the whole Congress and like, okay, we're done with this corporate farming, corporate, this corporate, that, we're gonna go back to the roots. What country we would show as an example, in your opinion? Well, I don't know about with regard to how much percentage is grown locally, but I can say that a lot of the tools that we use, which are small scale farming tools, come from either Japan or uh, Korea. And right. that's because they don't have, they can't do the large scale farming there. Usually it's associated with like topography or that okay. sort of thing. Um, but because of that, they've had to develop these small scale human powered tools and most of their farms are going to be a smaller scale. Um, and I think it's when you start bringing in this idea of bigger is always better, which is like classic America, right? Um, that you run into trouble because it's just the farms got bigger, 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 which meant you needed bigger, bigger, bigger machines in order to manage them. And that requires fossil fuels, right? It requires um, just a management practice that is large. And if you really bring it down and start focusing just on that smaller scale, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, and I don't think we have to look outside of our borders. Um, I, I think we need to just look to our history. Um, you know, 200 plus years of United States of America, 13,000, I believe, is about the number of years that they've tracked the history of indigenous people who are living here, feeding themselves, eating here. Right. So I think we need to really just look at how they were doing it and what they were doing um, and build better relationships with, um, you know, your neighbors and your small farmers and trying to help and feed each other and lift each other up. Um, and that, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of knowledge that I think gets overlooked um, that that's available right here. Um, I think a lot of indigenous people would be willing to have those conversations if you're willing to, to open the door right. um, and to listen to them. Um, so it's not just, you know, asking them a question and taking their idea. It's really understanding how they feel about it, right? Like, we're sitting here, Caucasian backgrounds, first generation. Um, so for me, it's it's really listening to those people and understanding what they're willing to share, um, and not just appropriating it um, to be the next, you know, capitalist uh, billionaire. Right. I mean, I that there was a reason uh, for my question. Of course, uh, I experienced that. Uh, in, my country of birth, but how major American agriculture company is coming in and doing uh, doing business with farmers on a small scale. And then by the time I finished high school, they weren't even allowed to use uh, their own seeds. They, they started, you know, losing their land or they weren't allowed to do uh, follow their own old uh, farming uh, skills or methods. So it's of course just like the uh, the, the thing we call 
the military industrial complex 